Good morning. Welcome to Portland Bible Church. Currently meeting here at our home in Vancouver, Washington. I'm Pastor Gary Glennie, and thank you so much for coming, joining with us for our Sunday morning study of the Word of God. And also for those who are live streaming, remember you can go to Judy Glennie's Facebook page. We have those up there for now over a year of material and uh, many, many things that are at our website as well. So you can go to Facebook, Judy Glennie's Facebook page, or you can go to the website, portlandbiblechurch.com. At the top of the homepage, it has services. There's a drop-down menu, and you can link there to YouTube. We post those immediately after class. And we have other services from previous years on audio that are also available at the website. Plus, we have an array of doctrines that you can download, read at your leisure, and study. And so those are available at the website as well. Also, we have a section for charts and graphs and maps and outlines of various Bible studies, including the study of Hebrews. We have an outline and an introduction available to you there as well. So all that material is available to you. So again, thank you so much for coming to join with us. Our services, of course, are now 10 o'clock right now, this morning on Sunday, 11.15. And after the second service, we have some fellowship and some time for singing the great hymns of the church. On Thursday, we're finishing up our study of leadership. have about one more class on the 30 principles or characters of good leaders. And so we're looking at that. And after that, we'll have a new study. So I'm not going to spoil the surprise, but we'll be having a new study on our Thursday night class as soon as we finish the characteristics of good leaders. So that's Thursday, and that's at 7 o'clock. After our Thursday night class, we have uh, about a half hour or so, however long it takes, for a prayer meeting, and so we pray for the needs of the saints. If you have prayer requests, praises, thanksgivings, let us know. <clears throat> Call me or one of the deacons, and we'll be sure to include you on the prayer agenda for Thursday night. Also on Wednesday, uh, my wife, Judy Glennie, has a class for the ladies right here at our house, and she's going through the seven churches in Asia Minor in Revelation 2 and 3. They were, of course, literal churches, but we believe they're also types of churches all through the church age. And if they go in chronological order, then we're in the period of the Laodicean church, uh, which was the lukewarm church. I like to call it the lazy church because that seems to be where we are today. People kind of come and go whenever they feel like it. If nothing else is uh, going to be available, they'll come to church. And uh, and so we kind of have the lazy, lukewarm, Laodicean type churches out there, many of them. So hopefully you're not in that category and you're being a faithful student of the Word of God. And that's why you're here this morning. And so these are the classes that we have. And I do have a few announcements. We have Robert Brown, who's part of a, a group that's going to be presenting a drama, The Cross Changes Everything. It's going to come up on April the 8th <clears throat> at the Hillsview Community Church. So on April the 8th at 7 o'clock, and again on the 10th, April 10th at 6 o'clock at the Hillsview Community Church. That's out in Damascus. It's 23,000. 225 Southeast Borges Road. You better Google that to find it. It's way out there, but uh, they do a great job. So if you can get out there for that, the cross changes everything. It's going to present kind of the Resurrection Sunday and Good Friday, all of those things that are pertinent <clears throat> during this season of recognizing the Lord's resurrection. So we have that. We also have been recommending that you check out PatriotAcademy.com with Rick Green and David Barton, uh, information that is unparalleled with regard to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. I hope you've checked it out. I understand that Rick Green's going to be coming up here to Vancouver and having a presentation. I think Judy and I already have tickets, and you can have, I guess, groups of eight or something like that, and they get some kind of a discount, or at least you can sit together. Better not say discount, I'm not sure. At any rate, uh, and hear this information. So uh, he's coming up here and give us kind of the latest on uh, the difficulties that we're having constitutionally in our great nation. So uh, David Barton and Rick Green, patriotacademy.com, you can get that information there. Now, I also have uh, received, and I mentioned it before, we have this book by Robert Thiem, The Blood of Christ, and so we have these available. These are free, and 
uh, on a grace basis, simply give me a call or write, and we'll be sure to send one out to you. We have them available for our people here uh, in the assembly, and they're on the book table. So if you haven't read this, check it out. It's just an excellent presentation. We have a brief that's at the website under doctrines. We have the blood of Christ on a two-page. This is a longer version of that, so it gives you that same information plus a little bit else in addition, so I uh, give you an opportunity to do that. And then I had a question on a class a few weeks ago. Somebody said, would I recommend a good book on nutrition? And of course, uh, exercise, we can take care of that. Uh, at the website, we have 50 years of nutrition and uh, weight training. And of course, Judy and I have uh, been training all these years for over, <laughs> over 50 years now. And so we put these things together and uh, we have a few people training with us now in our home gym here. So, but as far as nutrition, there's a number of books we're going to post this information. I have some of them here. There's actually about four books that I have uh, that uh, are excellent, and you can order some of these. Uh, we don't uh, have them here, but one of them is The Seven Keys uh, to Better Health. That's a great one. That's a local fellow that wrote a book, and he just has some excellent information. Stephen Hine, and then, of course, uh, this one you can get for free online. This is Dr. Living Good. That's his actual name. What a great name, Dr. Living Good. And so uh, this uh, particular book has some of that same information, really good stuff. And then one that I ordered some time ago that has a, a whole menu plan, and that's by Dr. Furman. Dr. Furman, and his book is uh, Three Steps to Incredible Health. All of these have similar things, and so if you want to gain weight, lose weight, get healthy, these guys give you the prescription, they give you menus, he even has a workbook that goes along with this, and another book on uh, uh, things that you can cook and eat and uh, just do a great job. Oh, and then there was one I got from Bottom Lines, I don't know if you ever get this in the mail, the Bottom Line, they have a lot of interesting things, this came along with some uh, material that I got. I don't know if you can get it separately, but this is uh, uh, Secret Healing Formulas, Wacky Remedies, Five-Minute Cures, and again, some of the same material. So these are four books. It's not an exhaustive list, but for those that are interested, and if you forget those, you can go online. I'm going to post this, uh, uh, the nutrition books. I'm going to put it up there, and we have it here on the table. So if you want to look those up, some of them are free, some of them you have to pay for, uh, but they're certainly excellent resources for nutrition. And then I have about three or four other volumes for uh, all sorts of ailments and diseases and like that. Uh, no guarantee, but uh, things that you can do, things that you should not do nutritionally. Where this came up, of course was on our Thursday night study when we said that leaders should be in good health because it's hard to be a leader if you're unhealthy and are not able to function. So uh, uh, the scriptures are clear. It says physical exercise profits only a little, but it does profit some. The passage is talking about profiting a little, that is physical exercise, as compared to godliness. Well, uh, anything compared to godliness would just be a little, and nutrition and exercise are just a uh, little profit. Nevertheless, they help you to be better, to study and grow, and therefore function under godliness. So at any rate, that's what we looked at on Thursday. So hopefully you had a chance to uh, examine that as well. And uh, we'll take a look at those things in the future. So check those things out. It's our custom to take a few moments for silent prayer, the beginning of each of our Bible studies for silent prayer. <clears throat> this gives you the opportunity to confess any sins that you're aware of. <coughs> Keep in mind that the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance any sin that you've committed. Hopefully just recently, we try to keep short accounts, so you should check yourself periodically, certainly every day, but uh, very often if you think that you might be involved in some type of personal sin, whether it's mental or verbal or overt sin, you need to acknowledge it to the Father. The scripture that tells us this, among others, is 1 John 1, 9, that we quote often, because it's so important. We really cannot advance spiritually unless we have confessed our sins up to the moment. And in 1 John 1, 9, he tells us, if we believers confess our sins, that is, name them, cite them, agree with God that they're sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, that's the ones we just mentioned and named, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That picks up the ones we forgot about or didn't even know we'd committed, and we believe that's the means whereby we have the filling or enabling of the Holy Spirit. That is essential for the study, the intake, and the application of Bible principles. So we take time for silent prayer for that function. So let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is powerful, that it is alive forevermore, that you've provided everything for us for understanding who and what you are, your magnificent plan, and our destiny, sharing it with your son, Jesus Christ, throughout eternity. What a marvelous gift that you've given us, this salvation that we have through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. We thank you for the fact that we can study together, and we can advance spiritually and grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Pray now as we study this morning that you'll edify our souls, cause us to have spiritual growth, and to be able to not only retain these principles, but apply them as we understand them in our life situation through the ministry of your Holy Spirit. We pray all these things in the powerful and matchless name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approach. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open the word of truth this morning to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. We made good progress. We're actually in chapter 9. I know sometimes it seems like we take forever getting through a book, but we'll get there. I remember years ago we were studying the book of Daniel, rather lengthy, 13 chapters, quite extensive and uh, has both Hebrew and Aramaic. And so as I translated and went through it, it took some time, a very excellent presentation. Plus, we coupled it with other books like the book of Revelation in the New Testament and Zechariah and Ezekiel also in the Old Testament and some places in the other prophets. So it was kind of an extensive overall view of prophecy and not just the book of Daniel because Daniel's book is primarily a prophetic book. And so when we were going through that, some people said, are we ever, are we ever going to finish Daniel? And we did. We finished it. Seems like long ago now, but at the time, it seemed like we'd never get there. Well, as we go through, we go verse by verse, and it's important because, as Hosea said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And he's talking about Israel at that time and their lack of spiritual understanding and obedience to his word. And of course, we see the same thing today. People perish without the word of God, without knowledge of the things of God. Even in the secular world, if you don't have any professional understanding or training, it's difficult to progress and be promoted. But in the spiritual realm, it's absolutely essential that you have knowledge of God and his plan for you. So we have the fact that we study verse by verse, category by category, and as the prophet Isaiah said, here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept, that's how he's going to teach, even though the people mocked him and said, all you ever do is say line on line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. He said, yep, that's what I say, that's what I do, that's how the Lord wants me to teach it. So we're no different today as pastor teachers in the dispensation of the church than the priests and the prophets of old who taught categorically, they taught historically, and all of the things that we do with regard to the teaching of the Word of God. Well, if you have your outline, we're actually over there on page 5, about to wrap up the the ninth chapter, we're down there in verse 27, and this particular section goes from 25 to 28, and it has the superior time. We noted that all things are superior in Messiah's sacrifice, uh, the superior sanctification. Uh, of course, he was set apart. Uh, for the work of the cross, we, believing in him, are set apart, apart to a holy purpose and a holy calling. And then there's the superior covenant ratification. The superior covenant was predicted mm -hmm. prophetically in Jeremiah 31, 31. It was, of course, executed by Jesus Christ when he took that cup, that communion cup, and he said, this is the new covenant 
in my blood. Do this as a memorial and a remembrance to me. Also, he took the bread, and the bread spoke of his person, physical body, and all of those things are part of the signing or the ratification of the new covenant. So we have a superior covenant ratification, and it was ratified not just by his drinking of that cup, but rather by what that cup represented, his shed blood on the cross. So the two subcategories there in verses 15 to 17 are his death, and 18 to 22, by his blood. So we described the blood. We looked at the uh, blood of Christ as a category. We also have the book available for you on the blood of Christ. So it's important that you understand these things. So many in Christendom today have no real concept of these things. Uh, they have mixed ideas, and sadly, many of the pastors are not equipped, or let's say they're ill-equipped, or perhaps they just don't do the job that God has ordained them to. I pray that pastors today will wake up and that the Holy Spirit will convict them so that they become teachers of the Word of God rather than philosophers and psychologists and psychiatrists and bringing in human viewpoint into the Word of God. But the pure, unadulterated Word of God might be taught. Then the last two points, we have the superior location. Of course, the fact that Christ entered into the Holy of Holies in heaven. Yes, there is a temple in heaven, the temple upon which the tabernacle and all subsequent temples were based. In fact, uh, Moses was told to take the example that God gave him and to build the tabernacle. This was the first of many. In the future, there'll be a temple in the millennial kingdom, but still there is a literal true one in the heavens, in the third heaven, in the presence of God. We don't know how that looks other than we had a sample in the tabernacle and all the temples, and so we expect that it's something like those, except much more glorious than any of the things on earth. And so he went into that, and when he died on the cross, he died spiritually first, saying, it is finished. At that point, the work of salvation was completed. Then he died physically. It wasn't the blood that saved. It was his death bearing sins, his spiritual death. The animal bled to death, and of course, the blood was all drained out. Christ was still alive when he said, it is finished. It is finished there in the Greek indicates in the past with results that go on forever. It's a particular phrase in the Greek that indicates that, and therefore there was nothing else to do. Physical death had nothing to do with the salvation of mankind. I know people find that very difficult. The physical blood did not save. It was his spiritual death bearing sin that saves. The word blood, of course, comes from the Levitical system and therefore is a metaphor, just like the same time when Jesus told those that were around that they had to drink his blood and eat his body, uh, eat his flesh. And of course, many people went away because they thought, is he suggesting cannibalism? Of course not. Even today, some churches think that the bread and the blood become that of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. They do not. They are a representative analogy. And therefore, all through the Old Testament, we had symbols and types in the Levitical system. Christ fulfilled all those, of course, being the antitype and the reality that was foretold prophetically. So we have that. And he went into that third heaven and simply said to the Father, this is my opinion, uh, mission accomplished. Uh, or he might have just said, it is finished again. And uh, he was home. And the father said, sit at my right hand. And we see that repeated multiple times uh, in the scripture, particularly several times here in the book of Hebrews. And finally, then verses 25 to 28, we have the superior time. And that is uh, comparing with the Levitical priests who offer daily sacrifices, 365 days a year. And as some would say, more on the Sabbath, because they offered more on the Sabbath, and then on the festival days, still more. And so many, many sacrifices. If you could go back and see that, you would be amazed at all the animal sacrifices that, that were given in offering and the, the slaughter and the blood that was there. As I think back on it, I'm, I'm amazed at how many sacrifices, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of sacrifices as part of the worship in Israel. I'm just so glad we don't have to do that today. We have communion and the water baptism, which signals that we have been born again, that we enter into union with Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, water baptism. And then, of course, symbolically by the cup and the bread in the communion service. That's it. 
And yet, even when we have those, some people do not fulfill water baptism. Some people look lightly at the communion, and it's not something that they like because they say, well, let's get on with the teaching. It is the teaching. It's the very essence of the salvation that we have through faith in Jesus Christ. And so it's not a separate or add-on. It is part of the teaching of the Word of God. Israel did sacrifices and rituals 365 days a year. We have communion once a month, and some people think it's a, a labor to do that. It is not. It should be a time of great blessing and grace and experiencing the presence of the Lord during the taking of those elements, commemorating <laughs> his death until he comes. And so he says, do this till I come back. Prophetically, he's going to come back. And so in the meantime, we have one time water baptism and multiple times the communion anticipating his return. So that's 25 through 28. I'm going to start in verse 27, actually start in verse 24 and get a running start here because it's uh, verse 27 and 28 are predicated upon these earlier verses. So we're going to read 24, 25, and 26. If you have your Bible, I hope you're open to Hebrews chapter 9. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Well, we just described that in our introduction. Nor was it that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood not of his own. So the high priest, of course, took the offering and uh, on the um, altar of burnt offering, he would uh, sprinkle blood on the four posts and sprinkle blood in many, many places. According to the system in the Mosaic Covenant, uh, there was blood sprinkled all over the place. And of course, that was symbolic of the cleansing of all those things. You think, ooh, if I spilled blood on something, I'd have to clean it up immediately. And yet, symbolically, blood is a cleanse. A cleansing agent. In fact, it is a cleansing part of the body. Blood cleanses the body. It takes nutrient to the cells. It carries away the waste. So the blood in our body is a cleansing agent. And so in the metaphor, it was used that way in the Old Testament. Uh, but he took blood, not his own, his own physical blood, but the blood of the animals. And then verse 26, otherwise he, Jesus Christ, would have needed to suffer often from the foundation of the world. If it was an exact copy, if the death of Christ on the cross was an exact copy to the Levitical sacrifices, then he would have to do it again and again and yet again. But he did not. He did it once, fulfilling everything that the priests did by way of the uh, symbolic sacrifices. And so it says to suffer once from the foundation of the world, but rather now, once, once and for all time, to the, um, at the consummation, uh, he has been made manifest to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Over and over, the writer of Hebrews expresses Christ's death on the cross is the only means for eternal salvation. And I know that there are a lot of people that this just ruffles their feathers. They say, well, there's many ways to God. No, Jesus said, I am that way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The counterculture today is totally antithetical to that notion, to the Bible itself, to God in general, and specifically to the blood of Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. Nevertheless, the scripture says that is reality. And apart from that reality, there is no reality. Everything else is imagination, vain speculation. And so he himself sacrificed to put away sin once and for all time. That brings us then to verse 27, which is the verse that we begin with today. Hebrews 9, 27. And so he continues the thought here. I know they have a period at the end of verse 26 in your Bible, but actually he continues right on. And we have the conjunction, chi in the Greek, and. So in a sentence, normally if you have and, that continues uh, the sentence. You may have a separate construction, but it's usually the same sentence. So in the scriptures, in the New Testament, and for that matter, in the Old Testament, we don't always have the verses synchronized with the uh, sentence structure. Sometimes sentences go on for three, four, or even as much as 14 verses, if you can imagine, in the first chapter of Ephesians. One verse, 
but it's not. It's 14 verses, but it's actually one complete sentence. How'd you like to diagram that? Some of you uh, senior citizens who used to diagram sentences. <laughs> I did. That's how I remember those. And of course, I did some diagramming of sentences in the Greek. And boy, if that, you take a whole page and several pages to do one uh, one verse or uh, one sentence that's made up of multiple mm -hmm. verses. At any rate, it says here, and inasmuch as it is reserved for men to die once, and after that, the judgment. And so basically, he is talking here in this verse about the concept of judgment. And the verse doesn't end there because we have a semicolon. So the New American Standard has it correct there because then we're going to have a new phrase a sentence that's going to talk, or, or part of a sentence that's going to talk about, so what? So Christ also, having been offered once. So he repeats what was in verse 26. At any rate, in verse 27, inasmuch as it is reserved or appointed uh, for men or unto men uh, to die once. Now, of course, the caveat to this is that uh, some men that actually, as it were, died twice. We have Lazarus who died and was in the grave several days. They even said, well, you know, I don't think he can help him anymore because he's going to smell. He's been in the grave several days. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And he came forth, all raped in, wrapped in the uh, bombing uh, gauze and so forth. But he came out. In fact, he, Jesus said, unwrap him because apparently he looked like one of those mummies in the mummy movies. That's what I think of coming out of the tomb there. And so uh, Lazarus was resuscitated. We don't call that resurrection. He was resuscitated. Some would call it resurrection, and uh, but he actually did live twice because he died and came back in a resuscitated body eventually to die. Uh, he was not the only one to do that, but uh, one that's certainly of note. We have those who never died. We have uh, Elijah who went up in the whirlwind in the very Shekinah glory to be with the Lord. The rapture church generation, that might be us. We hope we'll be taken up to meet the Lord in the air. No death. We go right to be with the Lord. It says the dead in Christ rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord in the clouds. So we're not going to die, hopefully, if we're in that rapture generation. But be that as it may, normally men live once and then they die. But of course, uh, the physical death is simply taking the transfer from time to eternity, going out of this body uh, into eternity. And for the believers, we're face to face with the Lord. We're going to, in the future, if it's not at the rapture, in the future, if we die, we get a resurrection body just like Jesus Christ. That's really cool. In fact, it says when we see him, uh, we'll be able to see him in his resurrection body because we'll be exactly like that. We, too, will have a glorified resurrection body. But here it's talking about men generally that they die once. And so we see this concept of physical death. Uh, we see it uh, in a number of places. For example, we just look at a couple of these. Genesis chapter 3, early on, when death actually entered into the human race. Obviously, we don't know how long Adam lived. We know that he lived 900 and some years, I think 950, 950 years, but uh, that was after the fall. So he may have lived several years. I don't know how long, something thousands of years. No, I don't think so. Mm. But he did live before the fall. And whether that's recorded in the 950 years, I don't know. But in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19, it says this, and... Uh, Let's see, uh, the one I wanted, 3, 3, yeah, 319. And in 319, it says, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, uh, for you are dust, and to the dust you will return. And so obviously physical death is returning to the dust. It's not a pleasant thought. Most of us uh, don't think much about it when we're younger. We think we're immortal <laughs> uh, in our physical body. We're not, uh, and the resurrection body is immortal, but the physical body's not. We need to be transformed, and so we go back to dust. What's saved is the soul and the spirit that go to be with the Lord, and we get a resurrection body uh, when we, cut, we go to the rapture, or the Lord, of course, uh, prepares those at the second advent for a similar resurrection body. In the meantime, we have physical death, and it says that here in the very beginning. Then we can go over to the book of Psalms in Psalm 90. 
Psalm 90, verse 3. As I mentioned, I have a new Bible. My other one is completely worn out, and the pages stick together here. They're not well worn yet, so Psalm 90 and verse 3. Psalm 90, verse 3. Thou dost, uh, thou dost turn man back into dust, and dost say, Return, O children of men. Uh, and so we see again what we saw in Genesis. We see it over in Psalm 104. So it's mentioned multiple times the idea of physical death, including the passage we're studying in Hebrews chapter 9, 27. So over in Hebrew or in Psalm 104, Psalm 104, verse 29, Thou dost hide thy face; they are dismayed and does take away their spirit, they expire, and they return to their dust. Their dust, of course, we're made of dust. You remember in Genesis, God says he formed men out of the dust of the ground, and then he blew, blew into his nostrils the soul life of lives. Two nostrils, we have physical life, and we have spiritual life. Uh, of course, he lost the spiritual life when he and his wife, Eve, Cheva in the Hebrew, uh, the first woman who sinned and then man sinned. And because they did, when they sinned, they lost their spiritual life. They died spiritually, but they didn't die physically till, uh, in the case of Adam, 950 years later. And so obviously, uh, spiritual death is not the same as physical death. And so they lost one of them. And of course, that had to be regained. And God prepared that by the animal sacrifices. And therefore, they were saved by that sacrificial act that God provided the animal skin for the man and the woman. And subsequent to that, every member of the human race must come before the, the, the Lord by some sacrifice. In the Old Testament, it was anticipating Christ's death on the cross. Now, of course, that's a completed fact, and we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross and we have salvation. But here it's talking about men dying. And so we have that. And then one more, if I can get to the passage in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Well, I can't even find it. You find Psalms, keep going. Mm -hmm. All right, I finally got there. All right, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 6 and 7. Ecclesiastes 12, 6 and 7. This is the end of uh, Solomon as he was presenting the material, uh, much of his failures his attempt at having uh, great prosper prosperity in all areas in life, and he did, but he recognized that there was nothing greater than simply recognizing who and God, who and what God was. In verse 13, he says, the conclusion of it all, when all has been heard, is fear God, keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. So that's his summary. But he talks about death in verse 6. Remember him before the silver cord is broken and the golden ball, bowl is crushed. The pitcher uh, by the well is shattered and the wheel at the cistern is crushed. I don't have time to go into that. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was and the spirit will return to God who gave it. So here he's talking about physical death in this metaphor and he uses all these things to talk about the fact that you have physical death. Obviously, you're dehydrated. Eventually, uh, no water in your system uh, to uh, carry the nutrients around into the body and blood and all those things. And so the silver cord, of course, is broken. No connection between the brain and the spinal cord and so many things. But it all points to one thing, physical death. So inasmuch as it's appointed or reserved for man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Now, judgment comes to all members of the human race, even for believers. 
However, our judgment is not the judgment for eternal life. Our judgment is more of a check uh, for uh, re rewards, and therefore it's more of an evaluation, uh, and it is a judgment, but it is an evaluation, and it gives us the rewards or uh, the failure to receive rewards. So we have a number of judgments that are mentioned. We've taught judgments. We won't have time to go through all of it, but of course, uh, the judgment that we think of mostly is what most people talk about at the end of human history when God will judge all mankind. That's called the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Primarily, that is for unbelievers at that time. Uh, if there are believers, their names written in the book of life, of course, at the end of the millennium, and they're automatically saved by faith in the Messiah, but the rest will be judged at the great white throne judgment. They're judged on their works, as it says there, and therefore uh, their works, of course, do not add up to <laughs> eternal salvation. And so therefore they are going to be destined, as it says there, into the lake of fire, tragedy. So men die, and if they die without Christ, the final judgment is the lake of fire, Revelation 20, 11 through 15. But then there's another judgment. It's the judgment seat of Christ. And so in the New Testament, we see that that is for believers only, and they are in this dispensation. So we have in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and verse 8, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 8, we've seen it many times before. So in 1 Corinthians 3, 8 through 15, uh, here it talks about the planting and the watering. And notice here in verse 8, it says uh, that uh, he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor, individuality. God doesn't punish you for others. He doesn't reward you for the work of others. The unbelievers are punished for their own failure to produce the good that God demands, and that is the good of Jesus Christ's death on the cross. And the rewards, of course, for believers are individually apportioned by him according to our deeds or works. And it says here, individual works, we note. And then he says, so then neither the one who plants uh, nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. And then he goes through this and talks about the rewards. And then he says, uh, for we are God's fellow workers in verse 9. You are God's field, God's building. And then he talks about the foundation uh, there in verse 10. He says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, Paul, a wise master builder. How about that? The apostles were wise master builders. I guess I'm kind of a an adjunct builder as a pastor. At any rate, a wise master builder. I laid the foundation. Well, what's the foundation? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel message. I laid the foundation, and another is building upon it. Uh, one person might give you the gospel. Someone else, as a pastor teacher, might teach you all the things that concern Jesus Christ and is building upon it. But let each man be careful how he builds upon it. That is the foundation. And the foundation, of course, is Christ. So God's foundation is Jesus Christ. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, and then he restates it, which is Christ Jesus. He's the foundation. You build on Christ as the foundation. Not only do you have eternal life, but potentially at the judgment seat of Christ, we will receive those rewards. And then it says here, Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, or straw, each man's work will be evident, for the day will show it, because it is revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. So it's a time of evaluation, not judgment for eternal life, that's secure, but evaluation for rewards, individual rewards for individuals. Hard to imagine how that's going to work out. I'm only giving you... <clears throat> <clears throat> what the scripture says if any man's work which he has built upon it that is christ the foundation remains he will receive a reward so if you build on christ as the foundation you get a reward if any man's work is burned up fire always indicates a judgment whether it's fire that is on your lips to purify you know sometimes on a wound they uh, burn it to cauterize it and so uh, the fire of course purifies and seals and so it says if any man's work is burned up here it's a sad thing because the work he's done was done as a believer out of fellowship out from under the ministry of the holy spirit 
not under the word of God, but he himself will be saved. So the point is that the believer, even when he's out of fellowship, even though he does not produce divine good during his life at many points, nevertheless, he himself is eternally secure and saved. Yet so as through fire, we do have to go to the judgment. Everyone will come before the judgment seat of Christ. We see that in Romans chapter 14, verse 10 as well. Romans 10, 14. And so here he says, uh, uh, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? So the fact that your body, your physical body, is a temple, when we think of the temples of uh, antiquity, uh, the Solomonic Temple and those subsequent to that, even the tabernacle, obviously all of these things referred to a place where you went to worship God, or the priest went and worshiped on your behalf, and of course uh, they came before God as a mediator. Now we have Jesus Christ as our mediator, but we ourselves individually are temples. Each one of us, our body is a temple. That's why we are commanded not to defile the temple. And in Israel, they, of course, uh, sprinkled blood on the tabernacle and the temple uh, to purify it and to set it apart as holy. So your body has been sanctified, as it were, by the spiritual death of Christ, the blood of Christ, if you will. And so we have the body is the temple. So you come before the Lord to receive in your temple uh, the rewards or the lack thereof for production in this life. And we have that one. We also have other passages. We mentioned Romans 14, 10, but uh, we'll go to 1 John 4. 1 John 4, 17. 1 John 4, verse 17. Let's see. By this, love is perfected with us that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in the world. And therefore, the day of judgment for us, not the great white throne judgment at the end of human history, it's the, it's the judgment seat of Christ at, pardon me, at the rapture of the church. And of course, there's no fear in love, but uh, perfect love casts out fear. Uh, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. So he's talking about love, but he passes through the fact that we as believers can have confidence before the Lord when we come before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat. And then last of all, 2 Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. 2 Corinthians 5, 10. Here it says, for we, we, there's the plural, a first person plural, and Paul includes himself. You can always tell when the writer includes himself, he always says we, and he's writing, of course. The writer of Hebrews says we, he's including himself. And so John says that if we confess our sins in First John 1, 9. So whenever they use the first person plural, we, it indicates that Paul or John or the writer of Hebrews includes himself with other believers. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So we believe that occurs at the rapture of the church. So if we are that rapture generation, the next thing after our body goes up to be with the Lord in the clouds will be to come before the judgment seat of Christ and get our rewards. Then, of course, we become the bride of Christ and all those things ensue during that seven years plus during the great tribulation on earth. And then we have the marriage supper of the Lamb, which, of course, is the celebration after the wedding uh, and a great time will be had by one and all who are present at the wedding feast. So each one may be compensated for the works or deeds in the body. What we do now counts. Sometimes people say, oh, you guys, you say you believe in Jesus and then you're saved. You don't have to do anything. I never said that. Mm -hmm. As believers, we are commanded to live the righteousness and demonstrate the righteousness that we possess in Christ. Well, what if we don't? Well, then you lose reward. You don't lose your eternal salvation. It's quite clear here, but you have done deeds or works in the body according to what you've done, whether good or bad. Obviously, believers can do bad things. 
You know, some of the worst people I've ever met were believers out of fellowship. They were not studying the word of God. They got saved. They walked forward at a Billy Graham crusade or some gospel presentation, and they believed in Jesus Christ. They truly believed, but they didn't find a church. They didn't go and study and sit under a pastor teacher and be edified and grow in grace and the knowledge of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So they fell, as it were, by the side, didn't lose salvation. But of course, they are going to have judgment and loss of rewards. And that's what it's talking. Good people sometimes do bad things. Believers can have evil pursuit because their old sin nature can lead them into those things. All right, so we have then judgment. I wanted to look at that. So whether you're an unbeliever, you're going to get judged. I know, was it Flip Wilson? Some of you remember Flip Wilson used to say, here come the judge, here come the judge, and everybody laughed. Well, I'm going to tell you, here come the judge. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to come and evaluate us for rewards, and if they are not believers, they'll have to wait till the great white throne judgment uh, here come the judge. By the way, Jesus Christ is the judge. And as we finish this section, look over as we close out this first hour. Look at John chapter 5, the gospel of John chapter 5. Here is the fact that whether it's the great white throne judgment or the judgment seat of Christ, Christ is going to be the judge of all, whether rewards or judgment with regard to works for those who go to the lake of fire. John chapter 5, 22. John 5, 22. It says, For not even the Father judges anyone. I've often heard people say, Well, when I die, I'll go before God, if there's a God, and I'll make my case, and I'll say, I've got these good works, uh, and uh, uh, and these are my bad ones, but do I have more good works than bad works? There are all kinds of jokes about that. The one guy going up the staircase to heaven, and he's supposed to make check check mark along the way all of his sins as he's going up, and as he's going up, he bumps into a fellow ahead of him, and the guy's going down. He said, where are you going? The guy said, I'm going for more chalk. Because he had more sins. Uh, that's a joke. It's a time joke. You'll get it later. At any rate, uh, the idea is that uh, they look at judgment, that you're getting judged for your sins. You are not. All sins were judged at the cross. Those are being judged for works. And so the joke falls flat because it is not the reality of the word of God. But not even the Father judges anyone. So the idea of standing before God uh, is not really true. He has given all judgment to the Son. And then in order that all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. And then we go down to uh, the last verse. You can read the whole section. But uh, we see here in, uh, I'm trying to see if I can pick up the other passage before we're done. At any rate, uh, let's see, 22, the Father, not even the Father judges. I guess that was the one I wanted to see. At any rate, that whole section deals with this. Uh, Oh, here it is, verse 27. And he, the Father, gave him, Jesus Christ, authority to execute judgment because he, Son of God, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, all judgment. Well, we'll come back and uh, finish the rest of verse 29, 28 and uh, wrap up this chapter uh, in the second session. Father God, thank you again so much for the word of God that you've given to us that lives and abides forever. <clears throat> we thank you for your mighty presence, the fact that you are in us, and therefore that you have given us all kinds of divine operating assets, many things to solve problems. And those things, of course, include the confession of sin, 1 John 1, 9, and grace that allows us to grow in understanding of who and what you are. We thank you for all these magnificent things. And Father, for that one person who's here this morning without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life, we want that person to know that you had them personally in mind when you sent your son, Jesus Christ, into human history. Perfect man, un undiminished deity in one person forever, who saved all mankind from their sin by dying on the cross. He bore all sins, past, present, and future, of all members of the human race, once and for all time. And therefore, you can have everlasting life, forgiveness of sins, a future resurrection body, a location and home in the new Jerusalem, in the heavenly Jerusalem, and of course, a seat at the table in the marriage supper of the Lamb, simply by believing in Jesus Christ. God gave him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God so loved the world 
that he gave his uniquely appointed son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Won't you do it before you leave this morning? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and have the promise fulfilled of everlasting life and the forgiveness of sins. Father, thank you for this time that we've had and the study we have before us. Make these principles part of our permanent understanding of who and what you are and your magnificent plan for us so that we live confidently and do those things that are pleasing in your sight. Pray all this in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.